I remember, uh, it seemed like I guess I learned to read, read in Wentzville and, and, uh, and then uh, uh, made my first communion in Wentzville. Hmm. And then... Uh, Maybe and then, the fact that you had to move around so much you, I mean, you're such a sociable, likable guy. I mean, uh, the gals at the subway down the road, they they seem to lighten up when you walk in the room. I mean, they give you free coffee. They, <laughs> that's that's the Watts charm, you know? <laughs> well... The Bob uh, Watts method. Uh, anyway, uh, that's... I'm, but I gained, you know, I, I lacked some consistency, but I gained, I mean, I gained... Uh, um, uh, and I think I did did fine all the way then through the grade school, but uh, high school was a little different in that we came out of the, there were six of us, you saw your picture, uh, parochial school. Four of us went to high school. There was 49, I think, total in my class. Uh-huh. And there were 17 in my mother's class, so same school. Yeah. Same building. Anyway, um, <clears throat> And one same teacher, <laughs> social studies. Um, but we had uh, we had some things in the parochial school, and then my cousins, for example, were in the public school. But uh, in a way, I, there was there was this group of kids that had gone all the way through public school and right on into high school, and they had a junior high at that time too, you see. So, and they were, a lot of them were in band and different things. And, and so I was never quite part of that set of kids moving through. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, maybe I didn't want to be. I wanted to be my, I was a free, I mean, I, I did as I, I did what I wanted to do, more or less, and, uh, um, and, uh, I was, I was more of a privileged kid in town than, than most because mm -hmm. mother was in business and, you know, and I, uh, and I was farming and I was doing all kinds of things, FFA and the like. And, uh, so, um, but I was not a good student in high school. And so... I just wanted to get out of there and farm. Well, then, then probably the best thing that ever happened to me was when I had uh, I got out of uh, I got out of high school and didn't go to college the first year. I was working in the heel factory and I was farming and and then I that summer, '54, it was a terrible drought and uh, plus I ended up with. Uh, hepatitis and uh, I was yellow as a pumpkin and and mother had to drive me out to show Ed Dunard where to combine my wheat mm -hmm. so uh, and then the folks said well if you want to go to school we'll help you so and uh, well I was in the Navy Reserve too I was going to meetings once a week and we're up that summer floating up around Lake Michigan and the like so anyway <laughs> I went, I went to college and never, never came back. You know, I mean, never quit. So, but I was home. I never really got the college experience because I was dating your grandmother and I was home nearly every week. And well, I still had some crops to get out and do some other things, and and I had some livestock things going, and and uh, um, but. If you look at the demographics, when I was in, I walked in the dorm in the fall of 1954. Well, let me back up a little bit. The St. Louis Diocese integrated their schools in 46. There was a big row over that, but nevertheless, they stuck with it. Truman integrated the service. That was another thing about Harry Truman. He integrated the service in 47. I walked in the dorm in Columbia, Missouri in the fall of 54. Half of the guys on the floor were Korean veterans, just back from Korea. Uh, a real mature, tough bunch of guys. 
and serious. They were serious students. Bunch of green kids, few scholarship jocks, and two colored guys. So, as black people were known then. Yeah. Well, they were there because of Brown v. Board. And then 60 years later, my youngest grandchild walks into the dorm at DMAC in Ankit. So you see what 60 years does for... Um, yeah. And... Um, well, that that seems like a great, you know, speaking about the... Uh, the what 60 years can do, um, that seems like a perfect transition to your your eighth hero, which is Barack Obama. I was, uh, yeah, w I'm curious, you know, living in Iowa, I know that this is where his campaign really started when he won Iowa in 2008, um, won the caucus. Uh, why is he one of your heroes? What? Well, uh, let me just throw a little background onto Iowa. And that is 1868, I believe it was, or 1864, one of those dates in there. Iowa had already decided the thing about uh, schools. Uh, you know, they'd already made the decision. Mm -hmm. They were years and years ahead of the federal government on their uh, racial policy. <coughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, well, uh, I've always had an empathy for for uh, um, for people of color, and you know they the the black people built this country, and when we think about all the labor that was brought in and so forth, and the and and uh, I mean not that white people didn't, but I'm saying there was. The, at the time of the Civil War, the, the value of slaves in the South exceeded the value of all the industrial production in the North. Uh, that's what, that's how much uh, that was worth. And, um, and they never really got to share in, in the, in the uh, benefits of the country. And, uh, um, and when I was the summer I was 13, I was working for Uncle Jewel Bockhorst, my great uncle, and and when the, he and his brothers, with Uncle Elmer and Uncle Walter, and they'd put up uh, hay and stuff, Uncle Jewel would send me up to back of Cooney's and in his pickup, and take his pickup and go up there, and I'd pick up two, three day laborers, black uh, guys that were day laborers. Um, now he had a he had a full time colored hired hand as did Uncle Elmer, and Uncle Walter used uh, a colored hired hand a lot of the time. He a guy named Claiborne, but uh, anyway, I'd pick up these three guys and and they'd get in the back of the pickup, then I'd go by and I'd pick up uh, uh, Bob Allen, and uh, he lived in a modified chicken house, which of course World War Two they had built. People did, uh, you know, did anything to get a get a house back then. But anyway, he'd get up in the in the cab, and because he was uh, he was white, and I thought, this this ain't right. Um, th this is not right. And uh, was it not right? W what? Well, uh, I, I, like I'm I'm just trying to uh, establish like exactly what. Uh, I, I agree with you, but specifically, what was not right? Well, Bob Allen had had uh, they said he aired land. He 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 inherited some land and drank it all up. And and, uh, he, and, and the uh, these other fellows, uh, they never had a chance. You know, they were they were born into a. I'm not sure they knew who their own dads were in some cases, but. Uh, so the privilege of getting to ride in the cabin of the truck, because just he because was it's, white, yeah, 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 it's messed up. Now, if you want to back up, when 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 my dad was in service, World War II, we had a, a live-in nanny, uh, a colored gal, mm -hmm. uh, Dazarine uh, uh, Jackson, I think, um, and um, or was it Cannon? 
and it's some and there's sometimes her sister Gilberta would come out and stay and uh, um, but you know no big deal uh, and uh, so and then we were segregated but we inter but the community interacted constantly with with uh, with with the black community uh, mm -hmm. around there and uh, but I knew that I knew these things just weren't uh, uh, right. Well, anyway, I've always been, I'm always proud to, to think that a minority has done well because I realize they haven't had the benefits, the privileges that, that I've had. And when they get an education and work hard um, and, uh, and are, let's say, socially uh, responsible, then I'm I'm really I'm proud of them, and that uh, I've always I've always been that way, and so uh, uh, and I think Barack Obama was that in spades as far as I'm concerned, and I was, and and he to me Barack Obama was never uh, Barack Obama was never a black man he was a he was a person of mixed race, and I think there's a difference I mean I, uh, I uh, I don't mean to say one's better than the other. I'm just saying that that uh, and when when because I, I travel Kentucky and I when when you uh, when Mitch McConnell got up on day one and said our goal is to make him a one-term president, you know. Well, they failed. And I just you know you could you could just see the tobacco juice running out of both corners of his mouth and using the N word. You know, I could just you know I just. And, and I, you can hear it, you can hear it around Troy, that same word. Now, in our family, that was never, a, that was never an acceptable word. And, and I have, and I have to give a lot, well, the family, um, and I have to also, and my grandparents were in the, the gardening business and we raised garden plants and and our, some of our best customers were black people. Mm -hmm. Everybody planted a garden, especially the black people. Had they depended on that garden for, and uh, and so uh, I remember old uh, colored uh, Mildred would come down there, and Etta, the little Etta, and uh, <laughs> Etta was always a, a haggler over over. <laughs> she, she wanted a little extra, you know, plant or two. <laughs> But, and I was dealing with the public there, you know, with, um, anyway, so I guess I'm, I, I was impressed with, with Obama and, uh, and I wanted to give him every opportunity. And the thing is, whether you, any way you slice it, the man can walk and chew gum at the same time. And um, even though he is an eighth, eighth cousin to uh, Dick Cheney. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, he didn't have a say in that, but um, our, you know, he, now that this is his last year in office, and I'll, I'll admit for, it doesn't happen frequently, but there are times when I see how much hatred some people in this country have towards him. Um, I have really worried that he might be the first president in my lifetime to be assassinated. Absolutely, um, yeah. And just how devastating that would be. Now, it, I think he's probably really made sure that the Secret Service is, uh, you know, that that's not going to happen. Um, that was a weird way to lead up to this question, which is he's almost done with his eight years in office. Um, he's done things that no other president has done. Um, things that when we were watching Charlie Rose last night and uh, David Sanger from the New York Times was discussing um, the things that traditional presidents wouldn't have done. Um, 
as you think about his accomplishments and his legacy going forward, um, what do you, what are you proud of that Obama has done, and uh, what do you think will be lasting change or progress? Well, I think he uh, he finally cracked the barrier on the on the. Uh, moving us a little closer to a single-payer health care system. Mm -hmm. And it took uh, ever since Teddy Roosevelt to get there. And and does it have bugs in it? Glitches? Certainly. Um, but it, it it's never, I, as I told Sandy when it was first being debated and, 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 and getting approved, I said, it's like a gene eats out of the bottle. You may shove part of that genie back in there, but it, that genie's never all going back in that bottle. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, <coughs> so. Um, what what's amazing though is when it was being debated, people here in Carlisle, uh, they knew how bad the health care within two weeks they knew how bad the health care plan was in in Canada, England, Germany, and Spain. And I'm thinking. This is truly amazing because some of these people have never been to the Quad Cities. How do they know how bad it is in Canada? How come the Canadians that I've talked to don't know how bad it is? Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> so well, it's because there, we have... They, we what have are they have listening a, to Rush Limbaugh and, I know, and watching we, Fox? We have a, we have a media, uh, a segment of the media, which... A, uh, a slice or a subset of our demographic that is their sole means of learning about the world and current events and it is it, it's basically poison for their mind is the way I look at it and when you if that's put, the when only you thing they don't read the paper they don't yeah. take a paper yeah so yeah. um that is, I would say that is uh, an aspect of our country. It's almost the lifeblood of American thought, but it's like having a sewage plant that doesn't work, but instead just dumps it back into the the, the river of American thought. Well, there's, when back to Obama, you know, the, the, to me, some of the things that his assets, and I and I identified it when when I first learned of him, was the fact that he was raised in he was raised in Hawaii, mm -hmm. basically, but he'd also lived in Indonesia, mm -hmm. and and uh, he had uh, he had Kenyan roots, which was a British colony, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and 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 you might say he had royal royal. Uh, blood in terms of Kenya as far as that's concerned yeah. you know he had uh, um, and his dad wasn't any dummy he just had problems uh, but uh, I guess personal and cultural but um, and and his mother you have to give her credit and especially his his grandparents you know mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the fact that Obama had a world perspective that that uh, you know, even though they called him a Muslim and stuff, but he had a world perspective that that was uh, that our other candidates didn't have. Well, uh, and that and that's not taking anything away from John McCain, but uh, um, and I don't know why that comment that Trump made about McCain didn't didn't sink him at the time. But anyway, that'll that'll all come back up. We'll see, we'll hear it again. But anyway. Uh, I think, and I think Obama realized that, hey, you you got to play this. You got to play this world. You can't just do Iraq after Iraq and not pay for it. And that's where that's what Bush did, you know, Bush Cheney, um, whatever that uh, Carl Rove group, but. Uh, uh, We've got to be engaged, and yet uh, we can't we can't uh, we can't change those those uh, cultures. Uh, you can't just go in there and, and 
impose a modern de democracy in those in those old cultures when when they need a they need a reformation over there they need mm -hmm. a so-called Martin Luther, whatever, to, because the Sunnis and the Shia has been going at it for 1,400 years, and and uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they just uh, need to get their head out of the sand, you know. Yeah. Well, he's he's done, I think, an amazing job with how difficult a uh, situation he inherited, and. Um, no with uh, the oppositional Congress, you know, and uh, just, yeah, he's done a great job. I'm really proud of him, and I'm glad I got to vote for him yeah, uh, the, both times. The, uh, yeah, with the, with the, uh, to me, to me, uh, uh, all you can say about r Republicans is uh, they're synonymous with obstruction. And, and I go back to what Roswell Garst said in 1958 or 59, he didn't know where extreme conservatism left off and stupidity began. And that's, yeah. that's where we are. And that's where, that's where uh, our Senator Grassley is. He's, you know, with, with the Supreme Court thing. And uh, he's just being a hack, hack, uh, political hack. Yeah, well, uh, the oh, and I and I think I think, uh, and I tell you who impresses me and who and who we're gonna hear we're gonna hear more, you're gonna hear more, from, um, as a former first lady, from Michelle I think than we have from any first ladies in my lifetime. Oh, I think a after uh, yeah. they're after they're out of office. You're gonna I, hear you're, you're gonna hear more from Michelle, and um, and I think she's going to be candid about a lot of things. And she's I think, a great, smart lady, and I think uh, she. Yes, uh, she. Uh, it'll be very inter interesting to see what they both do once they yeah. leave the White House. So the next uh, person on your list, number nine, uh, someone that. Um, I actually don't know much about, and it's, is it Wendell Wilkie or Wilk? Yeah, w Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie. He was from Elwood, Indiana, and was, um, I'm not sure about his whole background, but he, he was the, uh, Republican candidate for president. He ran against, uh, uh, he, he ran against Roosevelt in 1940. Here it says it defeated Senator Robert A. Taft um, of Ohio. Yeah. Yeah, Taft would see. Taft was um, very much opposed to um, the. Well, he would have. He would have had Taft been the candidate. He would have fought tooth and nail against uh, the draft, and he would have fought against Glenn Lease. And Lynn Lease is where we provided all the ships and war material to the British. Uh -huh. Otherwise, they'd have been speaking German within a year, probably. Um, and we 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 helped we save England from a huge invasion. annihilation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The so those are two those are the two those are two issues that apparently Wilkie and didn't didn't fight I think that's right didn't fight Roosevelt on and <coughs> Roosevelt um, was able to put in the draft and of course I remember my dad I remember my dad talking about it. he said all the mothers were no oh, they, they didn't want to the draft their sons being called up and stuff and 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 but if it hadn't have been for that that we wouldn't have had everything in place to mobilize our people for World War II. It's true. The second thing is that Roosevelt had a secret army and air force up in Canada. I did not know that. And and one of the pilots up there was Tony Story from Troy, Missouri, and whose mother was Lou Story. And um, anyway, 
Uh, so he was a pilot in, in Canada, in the Canadian Air Force, learned, trained and everything up there. And as soon as the war started, he just changed uniforms and he was in the U.S. And, and in fact, he was in the barber shop in Troy. Ronnie and I were in there. And, and I was about eight or nine, and, and our, well, Dad was in the service. Uh, maybe about, I was about nine, I guess. Ronnie would have been six. Well, anyway, Jimmy Moxley, the barber, said, uh, well, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Lieutenant Story or whatever, uh, and uh, he's, he's MacArthur's pilot. And uh, so Ronnie and I said, ho, ho, you know, that's about, you know, because in the barber shop you had a lot of hokum. And anyway, so he pulled out his billfold, and man, there was bills in there looked that thick. He says, well, if I'm not MacArthur's pilot, I'll give you all the money in this billfold. <sighs> well, he, he, uh, he was also, MacArthur didn't come back to the States for years. Yeah. And, 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 and Colonel Story was his, uh, his uh, power of attorney. He pl flew back and forth for him. But, uh, so he had been trained up in Canada. Well, and all these pilots then just, they just changed uniforms and there they were. Yeah. We had a trained uh, cadre of, uh, you know, nucleus of, of people. Well, if for no other reason, that's why Wilkie's a hero, because he didn't fight Roosevelt on those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it would have, uh, and, and so, helped helped a lot to win World War II. Wow. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I noticed that, I mean, on your list, there are some people that, um, Wilkie was the first one whose name only sounded familiar that I actually didn't nod my head and go like, oh yeah, I, I know that person, I know why they do well, that. Well, he so, ran against Roosevelt in 1940. Uh-huh. Uh, um, well, that's, uh... Or was okay. it 40, wait a minute, 40, no, it was, no, because it was, uh, it was Dewey that ran against Roosevelt in 44, then. This was 1940, yeah. 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 Okay, well, um, our 10th hero is George Washington Carver. And you wrote here that he overcame great odds to secure education and became a renowned plant breeder. So, um, yeah. Um, what else, uh, or uh, what about George Washington Carver do you find heroic? Well, I'm not sure that he wasn't uh, kind of like uh, Jefferson and Sally Hemings with, you know, with children, but he was born down by Joplin, Missouri, a little, mm -hmm. little village out there east of town. And, and then he apparently somehow, and his mother had been a slave, and uh, um, that area of Missouri, it was, it was uh, past 1900 before that ever came under civil rule it, it was it was that south that south west corner of missouri down below joplin and neosho and uh that's all where all the civil war of desperados the the cantrills and the and the dalton gang and the jesse jameses and stuff uh there was no law and order down there but anyway somehow these these guys stole Carver is a baby, and apparently t they suppose because Kansas is right there across. The yeah. Uh, supposedly, uh, I thought took him over into Kansas. Well, the old man there, that was apparently the owner of the slave woman or his Carver's mother or something, went over and ransomed him back. And I don't know whether they were going to sell him or you know sell him as a slave or or, or, or whatever. <clears throat> um, well, you know, this was, anyway, so whether this, whether he was actually a child of the, of the, but he was raised, he was raised apparently with some, what do I want to say, educational opportunities within that family, in that, in that family setting. They got him back and raised him there. Well, then he, uh, he apparently uh, went to school and then tried to go to, 
school over in Kansas and they wouldn't accept him because he was black. And then he came up to Winterset, Iowa, and then he then he went to school over at Simpson here in 18, well, uh, they gave him an opportunity. And he lived in a, a little wash house behind the big house in, in, in Yanoa. That little building is inside of a building at the his, Warren County Historical Society. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lady whose husband was on staff up at Iowa State. And <coughs> I think she taught art, came down to Simpson to teach art. And, and she, and, and he had skills, but she, she decided that he needed, this was an aspiring young man that needed a chance, and she got him up to Iowa State then after a year at Simpson. And, um, and first he had to live, uh, you know, segregated and all. But he, he started to, um, you know, show a lot of promise in the area of plant breeding. And, and uh, now he's used in the terms of the butterfly effect. The old guy down in uh, there by Joplin, and you do a little something here, and then, then he comes up to, and then it manifests itself, comes up to Simpson, and he goes up to Iowa State. And then um, Henry Wallace's dad apparently taught a course at Iowa State. And they also had the Wallace's Farmer magazine and so forth. And then, and Henry as a boy would, would tag along with George Washington Carver and go out and look at these plant, his plants and stuff that he was propagating there on the campus. And then later on, Henry Wallace then became a, a, a founder of a Pioneer Seed Company. Uh -huh. So, uh, and, and worked with hybrid seed corns. And Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President, you know, under, uh, under Roosevelt. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, then of course Washington, George Washington Carver went on down to whether it was it uh, was it Tux, Tuskegee or wherever it was, he went and you know became renowned as a plant breeder, and, and especially peanuts, all the various products that you make made from peanuts. So I always said, well, the reason I like him, I'm an Aggie and I like peanut butter. Mm. <laughs> so, but the. When you look at, oh, Henry Wallace, as vice president, went to Mexico and, and, he, and evaluated some of their, uh, they were having a terrible time feeding their people, and they ne decided they needed a, the research stations, the extension the research station like they had in Iowa. And so he went to, he went to the Rockefeller Foundation, and they funded this research project in Mexico, and they hired Norman Borlaug to run it. Well, he was the father of the Green Revolution. So you see, if you take the butterfly effect from Janet Joplin through George Washington Carver through Henry Wallace through Norman Borlaug, and and, and Borlaug is <coughs> reputed to have saved two billion lives. Two because billion? Two billion lives because of enhanced plant breeding. Uh, yeah, that's the Green odd. Revolution. Yeah. The Green Revolution. So, and, and of course, Carver in, in his own uh, self, you know, uh, had, uh, you know, great, great strides in, in uh, plant breeding and peanuts and their use and, and it, because they'd grow in they'd grow in poor soils and you know and it was a high, highly nutritious food and and it helped uh, the poor sharecroppers too with a, with an income and of course so then what do you end up with Jimmy Carter <laughs> peanut warehouse <laughs> yeah the uh, the great chain of how all these people and their accomplishments are all factored together is is really quite amazing. Um, I mean, we just had some peanut butter today on our toast, yeah, so, yeah. um, yeah, well, 
You know, hey, Grandpa Bob, we're we're halfway through the, the, the twenty heroes. Yeah, all you need, uh, all you need is uh, for uh, uh, well, eat with peanut. I, I, you know, Mary Beth was in, you know, junior high or something. She was going to be a vegetarian. I said, well, just make sure you get plenty of vitamin B twelve. Huh? When I was in high school in FFA. We'd go to make up a uh, uh, an animal ration. You'd mix you'd mix corn, maybe some wheat or oats or whatever you had to go with it, and and with soybean meal, which was uh, at that time was a uh, uh, was an alcohol. No, it was a what they call the expeller process. Forty percent protein. They get it up to fifty percent now with the with the solvent extract get more oil out of the bean and so therefore what's left is higher protein <clears throat> but anyway the book the, the, the manual said you had to add 50 pounds of either meat scraps or tankage because of the APF the animal protein factor mm -hmm. okay well later on they discovered that was vitamin B12 so then they didn't have they could use synthetic vitamin B12 yeah Worked just fine. It worked fine. So, anyway, um, also, when I was in high school, uh, Nebraska was number seven in corn production. Mm -hmm. And since, since 1970, Nebraska has only been, has only dropped lower than, uh, Dropped in out of third place one year, which was a drought year, really drought year mm -hmm. in the early 70s, and Indiana inched, inched up. And while Indiana is a small state, it has some really highly high yield corn. Yeah, fields, high, highly yeah. productive land. But um, you know, like Benton County, Indiana's got a class A rating of. Uh, 82, which means 82% uh -huh. of all the land in the county is suitable for, would you might say, continuous row cropping. Uh -huh. um, the only one I knew that was a little higher was Pyatt County, Illinois, which was, it's a smaller county, but by uh, Decatur, uh -huh. Decatur, Illinois. Um, and it says an 83, so, I mean, I'm just throwing those things out. I mean, I only, re <laughs> I only remember little... <laughs> You, you have a remarkable recall though and to be able to connect it all I sometimes imagine your your mind if it were to be uh, physically represent it would look like the world's giant biggest pin board <laughs> that uh, everything you've ever read or experienced um, is pinned or clipped or taped um, you know kind of like Kind of like the wall, like the way you uh, decorate your wall with the things that you want to remember and connect. I think that that is, I mean, your wall is basically your desktop, uh, to use the analogy. And I think your mind is organized similarly. Well, I swear I'm going to tear all, take all this stuff down someday. You know? uh, it's <laughs> it's part of the aesthetic charm. <laughs> but I... I uh... In fact, I've got an envelope in there for, for you and your bro your brother and your sister, and and I shove things down in there. Yeah. And, but things like you know the you guys at the Five Rocks and all that. Kind of oh, stuff. I've got I've yeah. got a I've got a folder of memorabilia and newspaper clippings and things. So it's uh it's a lot of fun. Um, well, and, and I've got a ton of old pictures that I mean I've got. I said to your mother yesterday or the day before, I said, you know, she was wanting to come over here and clean up my place and move move me out and get me a better place. And I said, hey, <laughs> I said, you realize we haven't even, between you and Mary, uh, we haven't even been able to get together since mother died to go through all these old pictures. Yeah. So she says, oh, we'll do it, yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> Your mother's, the good news had, is, your hey, mother's this, had a bunch of stuff. That, yeah, you know, well, and here's the thing. This is the first summer that I can remember 
since she was at Minotaur, probably over 10 years ago, where it's her, today's her first day of summer, and it's the first time in over 10 years when she hasn't had to clean out her, her uh, classroom or move out of some apartment where she was, you yeah. know, and so I'm hoping that this is a summer that I'm trying to be very productive this summer with um, getting a lot of songs recorded, uh, cleaning up my house and uh, making improvements, working on this project with you, um, working on my book, um, and also traveling and going to concerts and things. Uh, I hope to get her out here. Um, uh, well, I'll be back with her probably next month, and that's when we can get the next five of these heroes. Or if we're here for um, a couple days, maybe we can do five heroes one day and mm -hmm. five the next, but we've made a lot of progress today. Uh, next up, we'll be talking about Thurgood Marshall. So, um, I'm gonna get in frame here. That's the technical term for oh, we'll get in. when you're in the in the shot. I see. So, uh, well, here we're signing off for uh, a second time today, or second time on this project. So, uh, if you've been watching and enjoying uh, the wisdom, the the intellect and the historical recall of Mr. Bob Watts. Uh, I'm Sam Segrist, and uh, thank you for watching. So, thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> thank you, Sammy. All right.